So yes, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, David. Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that in in introduction, Louise. Uh, yep, that uh, makes me sound as if I've been uh, in the railways for a long, long time. So I'm sure there are people on the, the call who've been uh, around uh, just as long and longer. Uh, as um, you said, uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about um, intercity rolling stock from Mark 1 to Mark 5. I'm going to highlight the significant changes between the designs, um, try and assess compliance to stakeholder expectations uh, through those designs, and I'm going to uh, touch on some selected technical topics on the way. I've derived the technical content from multiple sources, so thank you everyone who's helped me. Uh, and if I've for forgotten to acknowledge you, apologies, please let me know about that. But of course, so uh, as all the best people say, the mistakes are all my own, so uh, take care if you're using this uh, in future. The coaches I'm uh, thinking of, the intercity coaches over that period of time are the BR Mark I, Mark II, the Mark III, Mark IV, then the, the uh, uh, hiatus as uh, train operators and the privatised railway uh, came along and we had the Alstom Caradia, Pendolino, the Voyager Meridian and, and, uh, and we've had some Hitachi designs and, and lastly the CAF Mark V uh, to round things off. I thought we should start first by thinking what requirements actually apply to a, a, a intercity coach. Of course, there are a lot of legal requirements related to mechanical uh, uh, requirements, safety, environmental, uh, accessibility for people with reduced mobility, you know, PRM, and, and a lot of other requirements coming from TSIs, Euronorms, British standards, and railway group standards. There are passenger requirements. They need space for themselves, space for their luggage. They need to be able to get on and off the trains with reasonable comfort and be comfortable during the journey. So, so comfortable seats, controlled noise levels, and uh, uh, generally a, a, a smooth ride. And more and more today, they want all mod cons, toilets, uh, HVAC, information systems, Wi-Fi, etc., etc. The train operator wants a durable train. He wants it to operate 20 hours uh, every day in a harsh operational environment with rain, snow and wind, resisting the cleaners, the graffiti removers, pollution and whatever else the world throws at it. And, and the people paying the bills want a low first cost. They want minimum unplanned maintenance costs and we note that service intervals have been progressively squeezed over the years. And knowing that uh, these uh, vehicles last typically 30 plus years, they must be upgradable because what's acceptable today certainly won't be upgradable and won't be suitable in 30 years time. And the car body structure itself has evolved over time. Just to think of where we all started, it was a wooden frame and body, uh, basically a, a, a stagecoach on rail wheels and, and not much of anything really. The uh, period we're talking about, 1950s started with a steel frame, steel bogies, an unstressed steel body shell and much improved performance, but still not as good as we expect today. From the 60s onwards, the structure became uh, uh, generally integrated. So it was a monocoque st structure without a separate chassis, a stressed steel body and loads well distributed uh, at Kent Rail and Solbar and giving better crash resistance and resistance to fire uh, and, and comfort, et cetera, et cetera. Since the year 2000, maybe 1990s, we've had energy absorption zones 
into the body shell and we've had significant use of aluminium as, as the uh, body shell structure instead of steel. So what does that car body structure um, do? It needs to give sufficient proof and ultimate strength. It needs sufficient fatigue strength for a minimum life of 30 years and, and maybe longer as we'll see. It needs to have suitable stiffness because that's the way to a comfortable body shell design. And, and over recent years, it's needed uh, energy absorption, crashworthiness. So let's start at the beginning and look at the Mark I and see whether that gives us what we need. It was an engineering led design and the idea was to incorporate the best from all of the pre-grouping designs. It was to, to uh, bring together the features from, from uh, those uh, pre-war designs and did so quite successfully. It was just short of 20 meters long and 90 miles an hour top speed and all sorts of options on uh, how many doors, but uh, typically uh, two minimum per side. Here's a picture of uh, a Mark I at the East Langs Railway. And it doesn't look too out of place there, really. It uh, uh, has the, the uh, conventional BR livery, but uh, doesn't look too far out of place. I think the interior looks uh, much more dated, though, doesn't it? Where you had the uh, numbers of sprung bench seats, not individual seats, and lots of wooden panelling there. I think the, the thing that struck me about these pictures, apart from the, the uh, colours in the first class area here, or how deep the seats are in these uh, designs compared to today. I think uh, you had a few uh, Christmas things going on on that uh, right hand picture as well. So it was a non-structural steel body on a strong, stiff, uh, longitudinal frame. And that was one of the, the weak points in the design at the at the junction between the uh, frame and the body shell uh, was a, a corrosion problem for the design and that was a, a running problem through the life of the Mark I. Now this picture really is about the bogey. Here this is the Commonwealth bogey which was the second one used on the Mark I's from the, uh, the early 1960s. The coach designed over the year, the coach evolved over the years and, and uh, the interior eventually was uh, starting to be influenced by the BR design panel and, and some new ideas started being incorporated and, and these were encapsulated with the XP64 which was basically a Mark II prototype on a Mark I body shell and that uh, design lasted for many, many years, over 50 years uh, in, in, in one form or another. Initially, it was reported to have good crash resistance compared to previous designs, but that I think in the end was the reason why it was withdrawn from mainline service. But as we saw, it's still running on, on preserved lines. It brings me to mind the, the first of the other technical topics to think about composites. Um, as a materials specialist, one of the questions I've been asked regularly is, why don't the uh, railway vehicles use any structural composites? Uh, the aerospace industry use pretty well exclusively composites nowadays, and the motor industry seems to be going that way as well. Well, one key factor in this uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come to is actually the railways were looking at composites many, many years ago. A team at Eastley built a, a Mark I body shell design out of glass fibre. Uh, latterly, those said uh, uh, experts at Eastley, of course, Eastley's near the boat building uh, centre of the country, isn't it, where they've got experience in glass fibre too. And they moved up to the East Midlands and uh, were the core of the British Rail 
Plastics Development Unit or PDU. Later, they designed the seat shelves and the interior panels on the Marks two and three coaches. And uh, one great success was designing the, the end panels for rolling stock. Uh, this picture shows a very complicated structure, uh, uh, which means that the design doesn't need a steel uh, missile guard like many designs do today, as multi layers of glass fiber, uh, uh, which would be encapsulated by polyester resin, a foam core, and then the same on the other side to give a very strong uh, impact resistant requirement as used on the HST and the APT. They're also very, very uh, deeply involved in the development of the phenolic GRP resin. So it used phenolic instead of polyester resin for the composites. And that uh, gives very low smoke emission in the event of fire. And it's become the default material for tunnel trains in the UK, but also worldwide. So that was a significant uh, step forward for uh, the railways. The obvious place to think about uh, why we should use composites is, is for weight savings. And RSSB looked at this uh, 10 years ago in the project T712. They concluded the annual cost benefit is about two pound a kilogram. Uh, uh, this is actually significantly lower than it is for cars, which uh, I understand is about 10 pound a kilogram or for aircraft, which is above 100 pound a kilogram. So the driver uh, to, to save weight is lower for the railways than it is for the aircraft. So we need some uh, significant weight savings if, if uh, composites are going to replace the, the metals we're used to. The critical mechanical property for these things is stiffness as opposed to uh, tensile strength. And the stiffness measured as specific modulus, modulus over density, gives an idea of potential weight saving. These figures here for various materials, aluminium, steels, and, and stainless steel, compared to carbon epoxy like used by the aircraft industry and the automotive industry, and glass polyester composites uh, used in, in the rail industry for trim panels and in the, in the marine industry, shows that the uh, glass polyester uh, mouldings have a similar specific modulus to metals. So there's minimum weight saving, so, so no real driver for, for using uh, uh, glass composites, no real driver for a change there. There's a potential uh, significant weight saving for carbon epoxy composites. Uh, and uh, the problem with that is it's a very expensive solution. So the likelihood is that uh, that would be much higher cost than two pound a kilogram. So sadly, uh, we, we don't have structural composites, but uh, as mentioned, we have a good experience of composites in trim applications and they've proven their worth over the years. So moving on to the Mark II, this was, uh, as uh, Michael Harris named his book, The Design Which Launched Intercity Trains. It was very much influenced by the design panel, so, so it was lower engineering uh, uh, influence and increased marketing influence. This particular uh, picture is from a, a refurb carried out at Wakefield in the late 1990s uh, with the, the initial uh, Virgin livery. It was an improved uh, design nevertheless, so the engineers had had their say. It was a semi-integral structure, so we had reduced weight, higher speed capability, and they'd address those corrosion problems from the Mark I. But uh, I think uh, we all know that Mark IIs have had their corrosion issues as well over the years, though. 
it was a very big build. It was obviously built over a number of years, but 1800 plus coaches uh, built through Derby. Here's a picture from a Colin Marsden book showing one of the body shells in build. And note the absence of PPE as we'd know it. And, uh, and uh, much dirtier uh, uh, atmosphere compared to the uh, build quality for aluminium coaches of today. It was a little bit longer than the Mark I. It used the B4 bogies, which were the last bogies used on the Mark I, and had slam doors again, two per side, and a little bit faster speed at magic 100 miles an hour capability. One of the things that uh, was used on the Mark II was asbestos to insulate the coaches and, and also for various friction applications. And sadly, that uh, wonder material tend to be, uh, turned out to be a scandal and it's blighted Britain's uh, industrial uh, heritage from that era. There's been a real heavy toll of manufacturing stuff, staff struck with asbestosis over the years. Since then, uh, my, my uh, belief is the railways have tried rigorously to apply any new lessons learned very, very promptly and ahead of any legislation too. So materials like lead, cadmium and chrome have, have been uh, um, taken out of designs at an early stage. And liquid chemicals are now closely controlled using cost sheets and latterly, uh, the same controls have been used to control materials seem to have an environmental risk to, to move towards a, 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 an improved world. So from the Mark II, we move to the Mark III coat. It was initially used for the HSTs taking over from the APTs or taking over as an interim to the HSTs. It was considered by many to be the most comfortable train ever operated in the UK. But uh, as with uh, uh, the other British Rail uh, coaches, it gradually evolved. And one of the evolutions was uh, to allow it to be used as local and coaches. This picture here is uh, a uh, Anglia train with a class 90 uh, pulling a uh, train of Mark III coaches. It was a completely new, fully integral design. It was longer and faster, had improved crash resistance and more features. And we see the, the impact of the marketing people again. Uh, there was a uh, uh, perception, a belief that uh, the railways were seen as old fashioned and not competing with the aircraft. Uh, so even from Manchester to London, but particularly Scotland to London was seen as, as a uh, uh, competition to the, to the railways. So we had air suspension, more comfortable ride, air conditioning. We had um, work to make sure the seats were comfortable. Here's from a historic British Rail brochure, a breakdown of the IC70 seat. Here is uh, one of those outputs from the PDU, the, the uh, composite uh, back as part of the shell of the seat and all the other parts that made to contribute to it. And uh, they really succeeded with the Mark III uh, from, from doing that. It still had the slam doors. That's after 1993, uh, the, the doors had central locking fitted. I was after all lurid tales of, of uh, doors opening in service. I think I remember the tabloid headline was about the Tamworth Triangle, wasn't it? The Mark III was probably the last of the coaches that was built um, um, and designed using hand calculations rather than uh, a computer-aided design and manufacturing. Uh, I, I remember in my early days in the railways, uh, um, working closely to Dennis Hook, who had a big part to play in it, 
uh, sitting at his desk, carrying out such calculations on a scrap of paper, where the shrewd hanging out of his mouth. But uh, such accuracy and such knowledge from uh, these guys helped uh, build such good designs as the Mark III. I think this is the uh, picture on my presentation that I uh, like best. This is from one of the skilled guys at the uh, Technical Publications Unit at the Railway Technical Centre. It's an expanded view of the Mark III coach. It shows the, the dated 70s uh, uh, colourways. It shows the steel frame, steel skins, and all the rest build-up of the design. As I mentioned earlier, the coaches need to be refurbishable if they're going to have a long life. And the Mark III's have certainly been refurbished over the years. The, the first major one to my knowledge was in the late eighties. And that was a refurbishment 10 or 15 years after introduction to uh, the Swallow intercity theme. It was an, intercity, an internal refit and new livery. In 2000, the Great Western trains, because by then they were refurbished by TOC, they were refurbished and updated at Bombardier, new interior, new materials, and, and uh, a new uh, external livery. In 2014 to 16, the Greater Anglia uh, carriages were refurbished at Wolverton. They had a new interior and increased seating capacity fitted. And 2012, uh, Chilton uh, design modifications uh, uh, preempted uh, the 2018 major refurb carried out by Wabtec for Great Western, for Scott Rail, for Cross Country, actually fitting powered doors, toilet retention tanks, and, uh, and other modifications to enable uh, the vehicles to continue operation beyond 2019. 45 years after they were first built. Some internal pictures here which uh, came from the uh, Wolverton vehicles and they really really do scrub up very well don't they? That's a couple of external pictures as well and I know that's a HST uh, power car but uh, it uh, depicts the Inter 7 City which helped launch the uh, latest mods for the Mark III coaches. This is a uh, cross-country uh, coach with the uh, sliding doors and other mods fitted. The Mark III also allowed Brel, as was at the time, to, to uh, launch an export drive as, as they have periodically done. And this was uh, uh, based on what they called the international coach. Again, a uh, picture from the time uh, shows it here. It's a bit wider in gauge and the uh, no tumble home in the body shell design compared to uh, local designs, local applications. And they were very successful in their export drive. Sales to Ireland, Gabon, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and a joint venture to design and support build of a modification of this for China. So it was a great success. I don't know whether you can see on the screen a series of spots over the uh, coach design here. When the panels are welded onto the uh, framing, uh, they, they bow because of the heat input from the welding. Uh, and uh, heat spotting is carried out where the uh, heat is applied to one side of the body shell and then water sprayed onto the other side uh, to, to tension the panels, to, to reduce the amount of, of uh, uh, bowing and to give a better surface finish and uh, enabling the reduction in the amount of filler needed to give an acceptable finish. So we come to the Mark IV. And the Mark IV was probably the uh, first of the designs that were carried out using uh, uh, computer-aided stress analysis. 
British Rail had been deeply involved in, in developing their own stress analysis program, and that was NUPAC uh, that, that was in use at the time. Uh, and from there, uh, various other uh, uh, external uh, software programs have been used to support this. It was a new design for East Coast Main Line. It included the tapered profile from the APT, and that was provision for the later fitment of tilting capable bogies. Yeah. It was quite a small build compared to what we've been talking about for the earlier builds. And a lot of the uh, components, major components, were uh, purchased from other suppliers. For instance, the body shells came from Brel Derby or Breda in Italy, and that's now a Hitachi uh, factory. It was designed for 140 mile an hour running and operated at 125 miles an hour in the end, but that led to one of the controversial decisions uh, to use the SIG bogey from Switzerland instead of the Brel T4 bogey. And one of the analysis tools used in that analysis uh, to, to choose between SIG and Brel was Vampire, which was a uh, dynamics package developed by British Rail Research over the years. Uh, and that uh, is still used today to, to uh, design uh, bogies and to check comfort levels on unrolling stock. The Mark IV, like the Mark III, is 23 meters long. It had powered opening doors. Uh, it had um, first of thinking about um, energy absorption and uh, was a very good design. It was refurbished at Wakefield in the early 2000s and it is now being withdrawn or has been withdrawn replaced by the hard Hitachi cars that we will speak about in a few minutes. We're thinking at this stage, as we start to uh, move to the era of the aluminium body shell, to look at the difference between steel and aluminium body shells. Here's a depiction of the classic sheet and stringer design of steel body shell. So we have steel framing and, and steel uh, body panels welded on, fusion welded or resistance welded or even adhesive bonded to the structure. Um, and maybe for roof and for the floor panels, uh, the, the, the famous Wrigley tin uh, uh, metal sheets profile to give improved stiffness. They're repairable anywhere, a high part count, and aesthetics not the best, uh, and, and worries about corrosion. But they've been proven over uh, all of these designs we've considered to date. The aluminium body shells, which have been uh, in use since about 1990 for various uh, designs, as, uh, consists of some large aluminium extrusions, usually full vehicle length extrusions, welded together or riveted together uh, to form a, a, a discrete body shell. So strong design integration, much lower part count, lower mass, better aesthetics than on, mark, on steel body shells, and the expectation of better corrosion performance. The weld areas are not as strong as the parent metal with aluminium body shells. So the repair requires specialist welding skills compared to steel. And that means that uh, any repairs need to be carried out generally in specialist facilities, but they are placed over the country now to carry out such repairs. So moving from the British Rail designs, marks one, two, three, and four, come to what I've uh, um, grouped as the intercity multiple units. After privatization, 
the intercity train operator generally ordered multiple unit designs instead of the loco plus coach designs. I think a lot of that was to do with the fact that they were actually not carrying people from London to Manchester or London to Edinburgh, but rather uh, Derby to, to Sheffield or Sheffield to Leeds. So it was to the next town rather than uh, intercity more than 100 miles an hour away. These designs needed greater acceleration to uh, give shorter journey times. And the multiple units uh, allowing passengers in the leading coaches meant that there was greater passenger capacity. And we uh, do note that with these vehicles, the crashworthiness requirements for the high speeds that they operate at mean that passengers were permitted only in the rear half of the driving cars, but that's nevertheless better than loco plus coach designs. Most of these were DMU or DEMU uh, trains, so large diesel engines underneath the carriages. Um, but uh, the Pendolino is the exception, which was an EMU design. The first of these uh, was the Class 180 Caradia that came from Alstom at Washwood Heath, diesel powered and originally supplied to First Great Western. And that was uh, replaced by the Hitachi 800 unit, the IET. Uh, it's refurbished and uh, more recently have been operated in the north on Hull trains and Northern Rail, etc. So it's uh, been chased down a little bit by the Hitachi trains. Uh, which are now replacing them uh, on those uh, routes as well. So another steel body shell, again, 23 meters long, PRM compliant design uh, with, with uh, energy absorbing design and one two five mile an hour running capability. So quite a modern design. The most successful uh, uh, of the diesel versions of the uh, intercity multiple units in my uh, mind is the Voyager type of train, the Voyager and Meridian. This was a DEMU design, a diesel electric, uh, and this was from Bombardia, from Wakefield, Bruges, and Crepin in France. And that replaced the Mark II coaches that we've spoken about with Virgin Cross Country and Virgin West, West Coast. And it was a big build but with a variety of small builds within the 220, 221 and the 222, and nominally based on a Belgian railways coach. Once again, it was a 23 meter long design and it, it had one of the first uh, RVAR PRM compliant designs. Its USP, as it was introduced, was it had a facility for tilting. The West Coast designs, the Class 221, had a tilting bogey fitted based on a Canadian design. That was significantly heavier, but uh, the tilting mechanism has been used successfully to allow higher speeds on the West Coast main line uh, since introduction. The Class 220 and 222 trains used the lightweight B5000 bogey. That was uh, developed uh, at Doncaster. Uh, and uh, one of the leading engineers for that was Eddie Sirenki, uh, who I'm sure you all uh, uh, remember. The Voyagers were reconfigured early in their life to improve the luggage and bicycle storage space. There's been a recent refresh for the West Coast main line trains but uh, it's noteworthy that the West Coast trains and the EMR Meridian fleets uh, have new trains on order to replace them in the, those applications. They are though showing excellent corrosion resistance uh, for steel body shells or compared with other steel body shells. The major uh, issue with the Meridian and the Voyager is that they operate on lines that uh, are typically uh, significantly uh, electrified and they run diesel 100% of the time. So they are really uh, carbon heavy in their operations 
and that is not uh, something which we're looking towards these days. Approximately 10 years ago, there was a design concept to add an extra car and uh, suitable mods to make the design a bi-mode design, but that wasn't proceeded with at that time. Pendolino, by contrast, was uh, an EMU design based on an existing Italian train. It included many APT innovations. It was an aluminium body shell like APT. It had 140 mile an hour capability, but uh, doesn't operate at that speed. It was a medium sized order initially, but there have been many extensions since then. And now all the trains are 11 car sets rather than the initial knowing car sets. And the fleet has recently been relivered and refreshed. Coach car body length has uh, stretched a little compared to what we've become used to. And uh, as we said for the Voyager, tilt operational in service, unlike for the Mark IV. As with the Voyager, the Pendolino was uh, being operated by Virgin and Virgin had a strong design input to both designs to give some family uh, uh, likeness between them and to give uh, a uh, design look uh, as an aircraft interior. And I think Voyager and Pendolino both achieved that look to agree uh, by various methods. But like many modern trains, there have been complaints on both fleets that the seats aren't comfortable enough, that the seats aren't aligned with the windows, and for the Voyagers, that the diesel engines are, are a, a noisy uh, nuisance. So we come to the Class 800 trains, the IEPs, the Hitachi trains, based on the HS1 trains, the Javelins. This was an order to support Great Western electrification uh, and for LMER. Um, it replaces both HSTs and the Class 91 Mark IV trains. It's assembled at New Naycliff. It uses components from UK, Japan, and many other countries. It's capable of 140 miles an hour, and the usual operating speed, 125 miles an hour. For Great Western and for LNER, it was a big order. There have been following orders since for Trans Pennine Express, for Hull Trains, for Midland Main Line, and others. These car lengths are controversially 26 metres long, and that's been the subject of, of much debate uh, amongst the uh, railway engineers. The Class 801 trains are used uh, by LNER and not Great Western Railway. Uh, these are all electric trains and they've replaced the Class 91 and Mark IV trains. Class 800 trains are bi-mode and that's become controversial as well. This, unlike the Voyagers, allows electric uh, operation when the wires are present and allows diesel operation away from the electrified lines. So a significant reduction in carbon emissions compared to the displaced HSTs. But uh, many commentators uh, uh, would prefer to see more lines electrified, eliminating the need for the heavy diesel engine at all in service. And maybe over the next few years, that will come. An innovation that, that is used by Hatachi and others is friction stair welding. I mentioned the uh, concern about uh, weld strength on aluminium body shell designs and friction stair welding, which requires no filler material, is a way to reduce the risk of, of um, lower weld strength causing unzipping in the event of an accident. It also gives improved surface finish, uh, so uh, further enhances the aesthetics of aluminium designs. 
We'll come to the uh, last of the coaches, the CAF Mark V. This is the first non-powered coach design since the Mark IV. So it's uh, noteworthy for that. And it's been uh, applied so far for two fleets, the Caledonian Sleeper and the Transpennine Nova III, including the driver van trailer. It's reverted back to 23 meters length 125 miles an hour capability. And uh, hopefully the uh, Transpennine route will allow it to operate at that speed before long. Sorry, this slide's a little bit busy. We see some pictures here of the train and build, of the carriage and build, showing the nice aluminium and the clean uh, uh, atmosphere of build. I put the uh, vehicle layout uh, diagram uh, on here to show how a little relatively has changed. That's the same vehicle layout uh, near enough as the Mark I that we saw earlier. It has the seats arranged, the tables in between. We have toilet at one end and luggage stack at the other end with four wide opening doors. So, Classic uh, carriage design, really, isn't it? As we come to the end of the uh, presentation, I thought it's time to review those uh, design requirements I mentioned at the start. Over the 60 plus years covered by, the, by this presentation, the world has changed. Legal and acceptance requirements have progressively become much more complex. There's increased safety, environmental management, and many other features. So legal requirements, design and product approval are much, much different to what they were even 30 years ago. I think you can have your own opinions where the passenger comfort has increased over the years. Uh, I you know, would note people have got bigger and the vehicle length has progressively increased over time. Uh, so a similar number of seats are fitted. There are many more systems fitted now for passenger comfort and, 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 and uh, to keep them informed on what is uh, uh, happening. That uh, shows itself in that, except for lighting, the Mark I uh, had very limited fitted electrics, but today's trains despite multiplexing and, and, and other um, managing systems, they typically have 40 or 50 kilometers of electrical cable per train. The vehicles are faster. They were 90 miles an hour, and now most of the modern designs are capable of 140 miles an hour. But uh, our, our colleagues in track, I'm sure are working hard to uh, give us 140 miles an hour capability and, and operation. Actions taken in, in uh, advanced design in moving to aluminium and, and uh, other methods mean that the vehicle mass today is similar to what it was 60 or 70 years ago, which is uh, uh, brilliant considering. I think durability and reliability is an interesting uh, point. Uh, the reliability of modern rolling stock is undoubtedly much, much better uh, than rolling stock uh, from days of yore. But uh, durability is a question. The Mark I design lasted over 50 years. The Mark III design uh, is headed to last uh, 50 years or so. Uh, while the Caradia and Voyager replacements are in build 20 years after they were first introduced to service. So we'll see how uh, long they last uh, over, over time. I'll leave you to make your own judgments on value for money. But, um, vehicles are very expensive, but there are a lot of features on board. So, uh, just coming to the end of the presentation, I've described all the major intercity trains since the formation of British Rail, uh, and uh, I've looked at some key technical topics relevant to those designs. So thanks to everyone who contributed to help me uh, 
put the presentation together and thank you for your attention and, and uh, hopefully uh, I'll be able to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much David, that was, that was terrific, covered an awful lot of ground uh, in a very concise way. So now's your chance to ask whatever questions you would like. I've seen a fair amount of um, chat going on whilst David's been presenting, so that's great. But now's your opportunity to ask that, that question that's been burning in your mind since before David started talking and, and certainly triggered whilst he's been talking or of course triggered by the chat. Uh, so over to you folks. Uh, if you'd like to uh, raise your hand, we're gonna try a little experiment Previously, I've asked people to put the questions in the chat box and then uh, I've read them out. But in this case, I'm going to be a bit brave and say, if you raise your hands, I'll invite you to ask the question personally. Then you can phrase it in the way you want to phrase it rather than the way I want to phrase it. I should say at this point, uh, I have to say because of the GDPR requirements, if you don't wish to ask a question or rather, if you don't wish to be recorded for GDPR purposes, then uh, I'm afraid... Uh, you won't be able to ask your question. Uh, if, you, if you're quite content on the GDPR front, then don't worry, we'll all be um, asking our questions anyway. So without further ado, Malcolm, you've got your hand raised. And don't forget to unmute you, unmute yourself rather. I, I've unmuted. Well done. Dave, Dave, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Um, it, it, it really is good to canter over the history of rolling stock. Sadly, I. I think I was born the year the first Mark I carriage came into service. So uh, uh, I, I, I can represent this history across the, across the whole time. But perhaps a very topical question. Uh, many modern aluminium carriages have structural components attached with um, T-slots. And it, I've, I've been exercising my mind as to how you might repair a T-slot if it becomes fractured. Have you got any thoughts? <laughs> I wonder why you might be asking that, Malcolm. I wonder, yes. <laughs> uh, um, I'm certain, I, I, I am absolutely certain that repairs have been carried out of that sort of over time. And uh, I don't think I want to express a view on that just at the moment. <laughs> How very diplomatic of you, Dave. <laughs> very diplomatic. And that was an unfair question, Malcolm. <laughs> okay, you can rely on me, Louise. I'm yeah. absolutely sure I can yeah. rely on you. Right. Who's got the next question? If you can't find the, the buttons to, to, uh, to raise your hand oh. technically, do feel free to switch your camera on and, and wave at me. That's the other good way to do it. Okay. I've got a question. Perhaps this will help kick things off and uh, get a few more questions springing to mind. So, David, one of the questions, one of the things you mentioned fairly early on in your uh, lecture was around um, natural frequency of bodies and uh, resonance. Um, I have ridden on the IEP a few times and find myself discomforted by the resonance that takes place with those coaches. So um, perhaps a simple question to ask, but not perhaps so easy to answer. How much does it take to actually vary the, the natural frequency in order to go from a very comfortable situation to a very uncomfortable situation? Uh, and what sort of effective control measures would you put in, in sort of roughly which order? Uh, I, uh, I, genuinely don't know the answer to that. Uh, I, I will say that uh, it was always a requirement that the body shell natural frequency should be 10 hertz minimum. I think it did uh, edge downwards a little bit to separate sufficiently from the frequency of the secondary suspension. And then the uh, uh, it was to stop a natural uh, a uh, uh, wave uh, setting up. So, so that's my understanding of, of uh, um, how the uh, comfort levels and the separation was given for, for 
kind of smooth operation. And that was the role of vampire uh, in part, uh, which was to, to guarantee that level of comfort. So I'm afraid I can't give you any uh, technical answer to that. Don't worry, I don't expect you to be the fountain of all knowledge, David, but it was, it was worth a go. Um, if anybody does have any, any views additionally to that, then please feel free to, to chip in, pop them in the chat box uh, uh, and lend us your wisdom. Steve, do you want to drop in at that point? Yeah, just a follow-up question. When the HSTs first came on the East Coast, body drumming was quite a problem. It's, I thought at the time, I mean, it was a minor issue compared to some of the other issues, but it seemed to be affected to body resonant frequency. I don't remember feeling it in later years, even though I did live down south and didn't use it much. Was it a related issue and was it solved or did it just go away? I'm going to go for the hat trick. I don't know. <laughs> I, by, by, by I joined the railways, if it was an issue, it was solved. But uh, I, I wouldn't have expected drumming uh, from the body shell. The, the body shell was sprayed with an anti-drumming compound uh, uh, during build. Uh, and then there were other measures taken to, to uh, isolate uh, uh, passengers. It was certainly very noticeable on the first press runs out of King's Cross between the tunnels. And I can remember the press saying at the time, what's that? Yeah. You know, so you try and fluff your way out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, would you care to expand on what you mean by drumming? Um, a vibration that's very audible, uh, quite unpleasant, short term, you know, for perhaps half a minute at a time, which appeared to be the whole body shell vibrating at a natural frequency, mm. presumably uh, stimulated by some something in the track. But I've got to mm. say at the time, we had more pressing problems to deal with on the region. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it, apart from comments on press lines, I don't remember it being an issue. I left in 1980 anyway, but I don't remember it being an issue after that. Okay, okay. Thank you for that explanation. Bill, I think you were next. Thank you. Um, uh, David, can I just uh, start by oh, saying I, how much I enjoyed that tour de force of, um, of the history of, of, oh, of British Intercity Railway Stock Development. I've got many old friends and, and some, old, some old foes too in, in that list, so, uh, so, so, so thank you. Um, uh, as someone who's has bought some trains in recent years um, uh, and has travelled on others that others have bought, um, uh, I was struck by your your early slide about you know what does the carriage have to do and one of the things it has to be is comfortable for passengers. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and and there is a view which uh, I perhaps have some sympathy for, which is we rather lost the plot on that in recent years. Um, but I'm really and, and 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 there's a whole set of reasons for that. But one of the one of the reasons I have been given as to why it is not possible to have a comfortable seat on a modern train in Britain. Uh, is that the fire regulations now make it virtually impossible to have a comfortable fire retardant seat? I, I strongly suspect that might in fact be completely wrong. But but since you are an expert in that field, I thought I'd ask you uh, whether you have any 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 because it's too good an opportunity to miss. Um, it's possible to make a comfortable seat uh, that that uh, meets the fire regulations. Um, whether it's possible to make a cheap, uh, comfortable seat that meets fire regulations may be another question. Ah, uh, now, now, as someone who's always interested in in net revenue rather than uh, a net cost rather than gross cost, um, I've just got this sneaking suspicion that that attracting people to use trains rather than accommodating those who turn up, whether we want them or not. Uh, is a railway business reality we need to rediscover? Yeah, uh, I. I uh, <laughs> Do agree with you. The the um, many journeys I had on cross country, where people were, were standing for for long distances, and were saying, "Well, I decided to try it once rather than go in the car, and this is I'll never use uh, the train again because this is a terrible uh, journey." Uh, comfort, yeah. I, I think. Yeah, on the, on the, the, the fire, the, you know, the comfortable fire compliant seat, have you any idea, and, and no is a perfectly good answer, but have you got any idea as to the, uh, 
at what sort of premium cost might be involved? You know, is it twice as expensive to have a comfy seat? Um, or I, th or I think I'd know? rather have a chat with you offline about this. Uh, if that Maybe was, that, uh, that, that I will take you up on that if I may, because yeah. it, it is a subject of no little interest, actually. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Jolly good. I think uh, I think that'll be a conversation worth having. Yeah. Nigel, you've got your hand raised. Um, yeah, a couple of things. Partly going back to Steve Hover's thing on drumming. Um, was it the result of all the track being tight to gauge on the East Coast? Um, mm. Because obviously the East Coast opt had to adopt a partly warm profile with thinner flanges because the East Coast had been relayed to, um, was it 1432 instead of 1435? And I wonder if the drubbing was a result of that tight trap gauge, potentially. But the other thing that the Mark III body shell does do when it passes, shall we say, stiffer, heavier rolling stock, is that amount of body um, pant, if you like, where you know the, literally the body shell does actually does actually shift inwards, mm -hmm. you know, and you feel it when you pass a train and. I don't think they've noticed it potentially on the Western in the early days because the tracks were further apart. Um, hmm. so, so perhaps that is what you're talking about in terms of drumming, whether it was a, 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 a bogey ride issue that was coming through into the body shell. Go on, Steve. Can I answer that one, Louise? By all means. Uh, no, the particular instance I'm talking about, A, you at low speed, and the one that stuck in my mind was between the tunnels at King's Cross, so it was probably the old track. Well, I think right. what you're referring to on the track gauge issue came much later on. I got this amount of goldfinch at the night mm -hmm. I met immediately. When they laid the Selby diversion, they apparently laid it to a slightly tighter gauge and had a lot of bogey hunting on that stretch of track. And the civil engineers had to go around fitting, I think it was tilted fish plates, to get the gauge back to what it was elsewhere. I think they're totally separate issues. But mm. the drumming I'm talking about was on, wasn't at high speed. It was a short period, but very noticeable. Um, and I, I can't remember the end of it, to be honest. Yeah. So I probably left by then. All right. Mm. Can, I, can I make one other sort of debate point? Yes, um, of course. Mark twos and Mark threes had centre partitions that were described as stiffening partitions. Um, does anyone know exactly what they were put there for? Because obviously in later years, certain operators removed those partitions to get more seats in. And one wonders whether um, they were there for a reason and perhaps it might have been rollover performance in an accident. Anyone prepared to discuss? I have heard that said as well, Nigel. I, uh, I haven't been able to talk to the people who were around when those uh, vehicles were designed uh, to, to uh, uh, find any more information about, about it. Mm. So, so uh, I, I know where you're, you're coming from with the question, but it uh, yeah. can't help. So, certainly the um in that day they were trying to take as much weight out of that vehicle as they could and you do wonder you know why they put them in if they weren't put in for a, a specific reason you know but uh, it, it we may never know because yeah. most people yeah. that designed it aren't around anymore yeah well, it could have been to give the effect of the compartments as well mm. Mm. but they, they were tied in to every structural member in that body side yeah. When you get the drawings out, they are actually welded to every piece of steel they could touch. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's con conceivable, I suppose, that REIB might be looking at that uh, as mm. a consequence of, of the Stonehaven incident and to be able to reproduce the, the design now quickly and test that by FEA is a great deal easier than it might have been, say, 30, 40 years ago. So mm. um, I think... Uh, perhaps, uh, sorry, was, there, was that Joanne or somebody trying to uh, interject, it, it, or is it Liz? It's Liz. 
um, there is actually a document that First Great Western put together to actually prove that those centre partitions are not structural. Um, okay. And it might be worth look, uh, talking to some of the people down there to see if they still have that on file. Thank you. That's very helpful. Sam, I think you've got your hand up next as well. Sam yes. Marchant. Uh, so I'm project engineer for Atachi. Um, you mentioned composites and then the role and why they, they weren't looked at, but um, have you uh, considered what role adhesives could play in the future for, for rolling stock? Ooh. Hi, Sam. Um, that's an, an interesting question. Uh, British Rail Research in the late 1980s uh, built a, a Mark III type design. It was a, a, a multiple unit version uh, 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 using uh, structural adhesives instead of welding uh, for the panelling. And that was very, very successful. Uh, I think uh, uh, the number of other adhesive applications on the railways, which have been more or less successful. So I think it is slowly uh, um, been introduced over the years uh, into the railway world. And uh, uh, I get uh, for me, I, I think uh, adhesives is something that, that should offer uh, benefits to uh, uh, the, the, the railways in general. We do have the problem that uh, was one of the worries with composites that uh, adhesives uh, um, means control of processes uh, uh, in the workshops, which is uh, relatively straightforward and at uh, depots and the like, where maybe it isn't quite as uh, uh, as easy. I'm not sure it's, uh, that's a, a true comment, but uh, that's been a, a, a worry. So uh, that's a, a worry to, to overcome if we go to structural adhesives. Thank you. Jolly good. Has anybody else got any further questions? Otherwise, I have one question, and I think it'd be time for us to close down, given it's now close to eight o'clock. Okay, and this perhaps is a question that will either last a long time or not a very long time. Um, for some time, the sort of lighter weight materials, uh, the likes of um, honeycomb floors, uh, for, uh, have existed in, in aviation. David, do you think there's a likelihood that even with the low value of uh, weight in rail compared with aviation, that we might still can see more migration of aviation type materials into the railway environment? Or do you think we've possibly reached what might be considered the, the greatest penetration of those sorts of things? I think that uh, uh, the way forward with things like that, that there have been uh, uh, honeycomb floors used on various designs that uh, one that um, I, I believe was a, a big use was for the double deck trains. Uh, the, the intermediate floor was was made from aluminium because the uh, weight uh, limit was uh, uh, the, the weight driver was stronger then. So I think the, the way forward will be integrating uh, systems and subsystems and then we'll be using maybe uh, um, some of the uh, um, solutions that, that Aerospace have, have worked through. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, Katerina, I think you popped your hand up. Do you, do you have something to add to that? I would like to ask a question, actually. I lost my connections as the question started, and apologies ah, for that. Um, sorry about that. I probably missed some of uh, the very useful discussion that followed the interesting um, uh, talk from David, and thank you very much for that. Um, yes, so I'm a design engineer for Hitachi Rail based at Newton Aycliffe, one of the people who are actually uh, working on a new design for, for trains in the UK. And um, I'm just curious actually to, to, uh, to find out how the trend about comfort has changed. And uh, I know David made um, a, a small comment during his presentation referring to the seats. And I know that has, has has been in, in the press for, for a while uh, regarding um, seats design. 
So I, I would be just curious to find out why we, we've got that tendency of going from large comfort type of seats to um, uh, smaller and probably stiffer, I would say. I'm not sure if that's the right term actually, but in a more minimal type of design. How would you explain that? I mean, it's not only a matter of number of seats, I, I would like to think. I think Katerina, my, my answer might be a bit too controversial for this uh, uh, <laughs> forum, but uh, I, I think uh, because trains have been running at, at capacity or near capacity for some time, I think a, a major drive has been to increase the number of seats uh, and uh, uh, sort of what Bill was saying uh, uh, before that, that it has not been the top objective to, to, to consider comfort uh, as, as much as to, to maximize seat numbers. I uh, see, so, that's okay. a, a very diplomatically put answer, David, and I think you're not far wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for, for participating in that, that Q&A. Uh, and thank you, David, for answering those questions quite so well. It's so, a pleasure. Yeah. Phil, thank you. Could you do the vote of thanks, please? Uh, it's, it's my pleasure, uh, Louise, to uh, uh, propose a vote of thanks to David. Um, thank you very much for sort of virtually coming to the Northeastern Centre. Um, thank you very much for... Uh, handling all the questions which have been thrown at you some of them you know i don't envy you the position of the sort of complexity of the issues raised uh, all the sensitivity of those but um uh, that always sort of adds to a great presentation when there is sort of interesting debate afterwards uh, one or two uh, of the questioners uh, have um raised the point that i was thinking about when I saw the title of this paper, it covers my lifespan exactly from 1950 to where we are today. And so it feels as if I've sort of been reliving all sorts of issues from uh, riding on the glass fiber plastic uh, prototype um, coach on the Hailing Island branch uh, in the 1960s, um, working on four VEPs at uh, York Carriage Works, which I believe were the last Mark Ones to be built. And at the same time in York Works, the first Mark Two Ds were coming in for um, uh, C3 repairs or some such. Uh, I remember being in the test house helping the electricians um, sort out some of these sort of miles and miles of cables that were on the Mark Two D compared to what they were used to. And a few weeks after I had the and uh, lo and behold there was the prototype HST with all the Mark III coaches running up and down the East Coast main line at 140 miles an hour. So I feel as if I've been there done that with a lot of these um, uh, carriages and it's been really um, interesting to sort of see the story uh, capsulated in uh, a coherent um, history uh, of the line. So uh, without any more ado, do, I, I'm sure that there's a load of us that um, have all those memories sort of prompted and stimulated by your presentation, David. Um, I'd call on those of us who are still visible to show their appreciation, maybe silently in the usual way, and those who are invisible maybe have to go and celebrate a, a whiskey or something like that. But very, very well done. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. So just briefly before everybody disappears to say there are a few more events still in the railway division calendar. Uh, at the tail end of this month, very light, low cost railways. Uh, the beginning of May, the new measurement train from Network Rail, our own class 66 conversion uh, to simulators. And uh, in line with tonight's presentation, uh, CAF Mark V vehicles on the 13th of, of May. So please do feel free to drop in on any of those uh, that you wish. Different centres have slightly different ways of booking in, but all the details are on near you. Uh, and I think that is uh, the last thing. If you do want to get in touch, you can use the 
um, email the contact you on the near you northeastern center page or the ticket source contact the organizer function um, please do keep in touch as i said if there are some ideas for, for next year please let us know because it, it will be uh, in perfect timing for our planning for next year otherwise i wish you a, a safe journey back down to your living rooms uh, and we look forward to seeing you next month with john smith so good night everybody thank you very much Good night. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.